What's up guys, JP back at you once again, bringing you guys another Top 5 Friday. This episode is Top 5 Directorial Debuts, and Jerry picked this one, seemingly a pretty easy Top 5 to throw together, ended up being painstakingly hard. I had a lot of struggle coming up with this Top 5, and I'll explain why in a second, but first let's go over some ground rules here. Basically, it is feature length films as their directorial debut. We are not counting short films as a directorial debut. We are not counting student films as a directorial debut. Uh, so that's kind of the basis of this. I also tried to pick directors who had their debut and it kind of launched their career in a way. I tried to stay away from like the more flash in a pan type guys. I'm not saying that these guys are bad directors. Take somebody like John McNaughton, for example, did the amazing Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, one hell of a debut, but he didn't really do much after that. He did an episode of Masters of Horror and maybe a few other things, but didn't really go full on into his filmmaking career after that, which is disappointing because Henry was a really good film. It doesn't count if they did a comedy first and then made a horror film. This is, no, their, their first film must have been a horror film for them to be eligible for this list. So I put myself in quite a corner here. So I started going over my list with the guys. Normally we don't do this, but I was struggling a little bit and I was like, well, maybe Toby Hooper. <laughs> nope. He directed Eggshells first. Not Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Okay, what about Don Coscarelli? Phantasm. Awesome. One of my favorite films of all time. <laughs> nope. He directed Kenny and Company before Phantasm. I forgot about that. Okay, what about Sam Raimi? This guy was known for Evil Dead, inventing tons of guerrilla style filmmaking techniques that are still taught and used today. <laughs> nope. He actually did a film called It's Murder before that, which I've never even heard of. Surely John Carpenter... No, I actually should have known that one because John Carpenter did a couple of films before Halloween, actually. Dark Star as well as Someone's Watching Me, which was a TV movie often forgot about. Okay, so maybe I need to rethink this and go modern. So what about James Wan? Saw was a huge hit. I love that movie. <laughs> No, he did a film called Stygian. Again, I've never heard of it. Let me go to an old reliable here. Adam Green. He is my dude. I love all of his movies. <laughs> no, I forgot. He did the film Coffee and Donuts before Hatchet. Damn, this was hard. So I had to completely rework my list. I pretty much started from scratch. I think I kept one guy that was on my initial list on there and there are plenty of other guys that I considered and then I find out no they did this weird film I never heard of. This is a hard list to make so without further ado let's jump into my top five. Okay coming in at number five we have the writer turned director Clive Barker. Clive Barker made his debut in 1987 with the fantastic film Hellraiser. I have it here in the Scarlet box set put out by Arrow. Funny enough, I just watched this film today because we, the 22 Shots of Moods and Horror podcast, are going to be covering the entire Hellraiser franchise in our next episode, which lands on Valentine's Day. So please, guys, check that out when it airs. Hellraiser is such a fantastic film. It really is a simple movie at its core. The Cenobites aren't even a huge part of it. Hell, Pinhead barely has any screen time. But the film still succeeds on its pure horror, really. It's sort of sadomasochist undertones and all these different elements that are kind of unexplained, but you kind of get them at the same time. It's a love story at its core, but it also has just an icky horror vibe. Clive Barker is a genius. He comes up with these masterful ideas, and he truly creates worlds out of his story. I'm talking about the world that he creates involving hell in the Hellraiser films. It's not the Christian hell that we know. It's something different and something scary. Now, Clive Barker's career didn't really get totally launched off of Hellraiser. He had a couple of follow-up films. He directed Nightbreed in 1990. Then five years later, he did Lord of Illusions, which I still haven't seen. Of course, he wrote Hellraiser 2 and Rawhead Rex. He produced a lot of things, has writing credits on a lot of different material out there. His 
directing career really never took off, but I thought his debut was really strong, so I included him on this list. Coming in at number four, we have the Italian Hitchcock, the master of horror, Dario Argento. Dario Argento made his directorial debut in the year 1970 with the first installment of his animal trilogy. I'm talking about the Giallo, the bird with the crystal plumage. Now, Giallos are not directly horror, but they're definitely in the vein of horror. They're very closely related to slasher films, and I think that it definitely counts for this list, especially this particular Giallo, because it is uh, much more of a horror film than the other two animal films in the animal trilogy. I have The Bird with the Crystal Plumage here on the Arrow Limited Edition set. This is a fantastic release. I highly recommend picking it up if it's still available. The Bird with the Crystal Plumage is a really great Giallo. It's probably one of my favorite Giallos, honestly, and it really established Dario Argento as a cinematic filmmaker. He did a really good job with Bird with the Crystal Plumage and it was a great debut and of course we know that it spawned many great films. Uh, right away he did Cat of Nine Tales and Four Flies on Grey Velvet. Of course he did Deep Red. Then he started his mother's trilogy with uh, Suspiria, Inferno, Opera, Phenomena, Tenebrae, the list goes on and on and even into the 90s with films like The Stendhal Syndrome I still enjoy Dario Argento in the 2000s. You have his very solid Masters of Horror episodes. Yeah, a lot of his later films are said to be pretty bad. I, I haven't actually seen any of those films yet but I recently watched Opera and I absolutely loved it. I know that's pretty much what people consider the last great Dario Argento film, but I say that Stendhal is, is really good as well. So Dario Argento coming in at number four, I mean the guy is amazing. He's done such fantastic movies over the years and I really think that his debut with Bird with the Crystal Plumage definitely showcases the talent that he had. Coming in at number three, we have another very well-known filmmaker. We have Mr. Wesley Craven. Wes Craven made his directorial debut with Last House on the Left in 1972. Now, take yourself back to that era. There were a ton, and I mean a ton of like satanic cult movies, a lot of hammer horror going on. The movies were a little tame back then, or at least in the mainstream. Uh, and then we had Mr. West Craven come out with Last House on the Left, and, and it kind of changed everything. I have Last House on the Left here on DVD. I've actually never upgraded this film to Blu-ray, and I'm actually really surprised that this is the only version I own. Like, this is a pretty solid version, MGM. There's a lot of special features on it and stuff. I've had this since, like, middle school. And I do have problems with Last House on the Left. I don't really love the film that much in today's time because... Honestly, it's kind of just one of those movies that doesn't hold up that well. At the time it was made, it was very raw and brutal. The violence in it is very, very graphic. The movie has such sleaze bags in it. I just hate those comedic elements. It really hurts the film very much for me. But to this day, I think it's one of the more important films that ever came out. I think it's highly influential. I think a lot of people cite it as a very angry film, which I believe Wes Craven even said that he was very angry when he made the movie. It still has tons of merit. There's so many things about it that work so well. There's just a lot of things that I don't think hold up well at all. However, as a debut, I think it was very strong for a young filmmaker who really never watched horror films growing up. To make a film like this that is so angry and just raw it is really remarkable. And rest in peace to Mr. Wes Craven. He was a genius in my opinion. Of course it launched his career. I mean, I think that out of all the directors that made horror movies, he's one of the most important because he has a hit in every decade that he was alive. I mean, Last House on the Left, Hills Have Eyes, multiple hits, and then the 80s you have the masterful Nightmare on Elm Street, the 90s you have Scream, as well as the underrated People Under the Stairs, and of course even in the 2000s I believe he had uh, Scream 4, so that was really a great career for Wes Craven. Uh, he did a great job, man, and I think he's one of the best. Of course, his filmography has some holes in it, but I think that 
to create, you know, arguably three of the greatest horror films of all time is a huge feather in his cap and three of the most influential horror films of all time. Of course, I'm talking about Last House on the Left, Nightmare on Elm Street, and of course, Scream. But with that said, uh, let's move on to our number two. Coming in at number two, we have the musician turned director, Mr. Rob Zombie. Rob Zombie made his directorial debut in the year 2003 with his film House of a Thousand Corpses. House of a Thousand Corpses is sort of a experimental getting his feet wet type of movie, but it still was very impactful. I have House of a Thousand Corpses here on Blu-ray. Uh, this is a good Blu-ray, and honestly, it's one of the best looking Blu-rays that came out this early. This was a very early Blu-ray, and, and it looks fantastic. House of a Thousand Corpses is not my favorite movie in the world. I do have issues with it, but I do acknowledge that it was a pretty amazing debut because what it did was establish this raw, gritty style that Rob Zombie is known for. You can look at a Rob Zombie film and know it's a Rob Zombie film. It just has amazing elements to it that punch you in the face, honestly. They, they come right out of the screen and they punch you in the face. A lot of people don't like this about Rob Zombie. They don't like his style. They call him a one-trick pony. I personally love it. It's He's one of my favorite filmmakers ever. and. Honestly, he did such an amazing job up until the movie 31, in which I actually didn't care for that much at all, that I thought he was going to be considered one of the greatest of all time until that point. And I know that there's some Rob Zombie haters out there that are about to dislike this video because I just said he could have been one of the greatest of all time. But just, just relax. So Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses has so many cool elements to it. It's very much reminiscent of something like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but definitely done in his own style. He pays homage in a lot of his films and things like that, and I, I personally enjoy that stuff. I know other people don't. It's always so controversial doing a Rob Zombie film on any list. I feel like I always need to defend my reasons why, because Rob Zombie is such a polarizing figure in the horror community. He really is. Pol Rob Zombie and Eli Roth are like the two names you don't bring up. It's like politics and religion, right? But House of a Thousand Corpses launched Rob Zombie's career, and quickly after that, we got a follow-up in 2006 with my favorite horror film of the decade it was released, The Devil's Rejects. Such an amazing movie. It is probably the best sequel ever made or at least one of the best sequels ever made of course after that he got halloween which was very controversial and there was a ton of hate i personally love halloween and then of course h2 and then he went on to do lords of salem which i thought was really good uh el super bisto and of course the last film he did which was 31 uh so not the greatest in the end for me, but I'm looking forward to his next film, which supposedly is going to be a sequel to The Devil's Rejects, so we will see. But I, I just think that he has just such a unique style. I, I just love his movies, honestly. And uh, yeah, that's Rob Zombie at number two. Coming in at number one, we have a filmmaker that made the list two weeks in a row, a film that made the list two weeks in a row. Of course, I'm talking about George A. Romero. Rest in peace to Mr. George A. Romero. I had a great time meeting him a couple of years ago. He was a fantastic person. His wife was fantastic. It's one of my favorite memories that I'll hold with me forever. But George Romero came out in 1968, guns ablazing with Night of the Living Dead. And this was one hell of a debut. Even though we just talked about Night of the Living Dead last week, I freaking couldn't not put it on this list because how important of a debut this was. This debut literally birthed an entire genre that is one of the most popular genres of all time in zombies. Night of the Living Dead is an amazing, masterful work of art. I absolutely love it. It holds up well. It's still scary. It's still creepy. It still has all these amazing moments and social commentary and yada, yada, yada. I could talk about it forever. But 
it also launched George Romero's career, which almost ended because of the copyright issue with Night of the Living Dead. It didn't give him any money. It didn't give him any profit whatsoever. They lost everything on that film, and the public now owns that film. Uh, but he went on to make great movies after that. Of course, Martin, which is one of his favorite movies. I believe he told me that it was his favorite movie that he's ever done. Uh, he had his hand in so many other films, worked with Stephen King and Creepshow. Of course, his Dead trilogy with Day of the Dead and Dawn of the Dead. Of course, his second Dead trilogy with Land of the Dead, Survival of the Dead, and D Diary of the Dead. I said all those out of order. But anyway, um, you know, he, he worked well uh, into his late career. And honestly, like, as a filmmaker, a lot of his films got you know, worse and progressively worse from these masterful movies that he, that he first did. But he was such an important person in the horror genre, too. And he, to the day he died, helped contribute to the horror genre. He um, taught and, and, and helped fund schooling uh, for f young filmmakers in my neck of the woods, actually. It's, you know, 10 minutes from where I work, the... Tom Savini Makeup Effects School and the George Romero Film Program. It's it's amazing. So, George Romero, Night of the Living Dead, number one. I mean, I, I'm sorry if the list gets a little boring. I keep saying the same titles, but hopefully next week I know that that won't... Damn it! Actually, I think there might... Never mind. Uh, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Um, check out all the other guys. And oh, also, I've been meaning to do this since week one. Um, the thumbnail that you guys see right here that was done by James Cox. This is an awesome member of the James Cox. Cox. I don't know. Cox? 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 James Cox. I'm just calling him Cox. He made the thumbnail and thank him for that. Um, all the guys who use it. It's pretty cool. I think it's really good. So see you guys next week with another Top 5 Friday. And these are going to get shorter by the way. I take way too much time editing these damn things. Peace out.